we have come to understand that modern orthodoxy is not is not uh, a diet light uh, colon. It's not orthodox light. We've come to understand that modern orthodoxy means we've got to be involved with prayer, with communal prayer. Attending public services, minyan, is very, very important, morning, afternoon, and evening. We've got to understand that we've got to set aside times to study Torah. And yes, we have gained from the passion of the right, the recognition of their passionate love of Avodat Hashem, of service of God. We've gained in those serious ways. There's a very deep part of me that very, is very Hasidish. I was very, very, my father comes from above of a background. My father was raised in what became Auschwitz, what was called Ushpitim. Auschwitz, that's where he was raised. He was raised as above of a Hasid. Came here, his brother was Babiv until he died. My father may be well as a young 92. Cut off his payout and become the leader of the religious Zionist movement. And I'm kind of a hybrid. I'm a kind of, I try to carry myself as a little bit of a Hasidic Rebbe. There's a lot of that in me. My father gave that to me. My mother gave other stuff to me, very, very important. That's for another time. And a flaming religious Zionist. But we gained that from the Orthodox right. Hats off to them. At the same time, the Orthodox right has to understand they've learned from modern Orthodoxy. Specifically, I think that the Orthodox right is much more involved in higher education. So if you go to schools like Ner Yisrael, it's very common, unlike years back, tells in Cleveland, for them to tell their students, seek out a higher education. Now, I think that there are differences. For us, higher education we seek out because it's kadosh, it's holy, as I said before. Maybe in the Orthodox right, seek it out so you can make a living, you can give charity and all of that. But still yet, that spiraling interest in higher education, in no small measure, I think, comes from modern orthodoxy. And I would say the commitment of the orthodox right to the welfare of the Jewish state, I think that was also gleaned from the modern orthodox religious Zionist community. Now, there, as I've said to you, there are also differences. Chabad, for example, is an example. Chabad is a complicated hybrid. But Chabad, in many ways, is the most open and non-judgmental Although I take non-judgmentalism, I take second place, I will try to take second place to no one. But Chabad's interest in the state of Israel, what, what is the interest? Because there are large numbers of Jews who live there. But to this day, Chabad will not stand at attention and they will not need Hatifa. They don't see religious meaning in the establishment of the state. Still, I would argue that their involvement in the state today Setting aside the Torah Karta is much greater than it used to be. That's what pluralism is all about. Just a couple of more items. I know I'm going long. I'll just touch upon this because I've given many sessions on this. Don't be frightened. I'll spend a minute on this. Women's roles. We know nothing about that here at the Bayat. Here, modern orthodoxy sustains a position that diverges from the left and the right. Unlike the modern orthodox movements, Modern orthodoxy is not egalitarian. I want to repeat that. Modern orthodoxy and halakha is not egalitarian. While 90% of what men and women do overlaps, there is a significant 10% of what men can do that women cannot and vice versa. The 10%, as I've written in Women at Prayer, I think has to do with the desire of the rabbis to protect the primary role of women in the home, and that's a complicated sentence that requires much more elaboration. For me, as I've said many times, rabbah is not rabbah. From my perspective, within orthodoxy, within the confines of orthodoxy, a woman cannot be a rabbah. A woman is a rabbah. The word lawyer is transcending gender. The word doctor transcends gender. The word spiritual leadership in Orthodoxy is much more nu nuanced. There is a male spiritual leader who's a rabbi, and there is a female spiritual leader who is a rabbi. And there is stuff that men can do, about 10% that women can't do. And by the way, there is stuff that women can do that men can not do. And unlike the Orthodox right, not only does modern Orthodox support women's equality in the workplace, it encourages women to assume central roles in the synagogue. 
in schools and community and communal settings. This is manifested through women's prayer groups, Megillah readings, involving women in synagogue leadership as presidents, as rabbis. I'm very proud of Sarah Horowitz. Sarah Horowitz, I believe today, is the most important orthodox, orthodox spokesman for women in the country. We in the Bible do not understand how far-reaching her influence has been. And she's done this in the face of sometimes, of sometimes shameful disrespect. But she is not the only woman spiritual leader. She is not the only one. There is a full-time woman spiritual leader at Lincoln Square Synagogue. There is a full-time woman spiritual leader at Anshe Shalom Rabbi Asher Lopatin Synagogue in Chicago. There is a virtual full-time spiritual leader at Rabbi Mark Angels, he's emeritus at Rabbi Chaim Angel Synagogue at the Spanish Portuguese Shul. The only difference has to do that we called it what it was. We used the term Rabbi. But we believe that women can play a major role in religious leadership. We believe that women can play a major role in the teaching of Torah, that there is no quantitative or qualitative difference in the level of learning that women can achieve and can teach. And we believe in the full participation of women on the highest levels of institutional leadership. One more distinction, public protest. During the most recent decades, and I've touched on this, the Orthodox right has opposed public protest as a means of helping oppressed Jewry. This approach is predicated either on the belief that God will intervene when God wills, or the belief that public demonstrations will lead to severe backlash. By contrast, modern orthodoxy is open to public protest, maintaining that it is halachic mandate to work in partnership with God. What we have learned from 50 years ago is that public protest does not render our communities more vulnerable, rather it protects our community. For the modern Orthodox, as I pointed out, quiet diplomacy is crucial, but public protest is the engine that makes quiet diplomacy work. Advocacy on behalf of beleaguered Jewish communities is crucial, and public protest, as long as it remains peaceful, is a significant instrument in social change. The miraculous exodus of Soviet Jewry, as I pointed out, is an example of the necessity of both public protest and quiet diplomacy. There you have it. In each of these ideological realms, the common denominator that distinguishes modern orthodoxy from the orthodox right is, let me just try to say it in a simple one word, is openness. Modern orthodoxy is open to secular studies, open to views other than those of their rabbis, open to non-Jews and less observant Jews, open to the state of Israel as having religious meaning, open to increased women's participation, open to contact with conservative reform and reconstructionist movements, open to public protest as a means of helping our people. It is for this reason that I believe that the term that best describes this vision of orthodoxy is open orthodoxy. It is open in that our ideology acknowledges, considers, and takes into account in varying ways a wide spectrum of voices. It is orthodox in that our commitment to halakha is fervent and demanding. Let's read the final source. Let's read number, number nine. Can I get a volunteer who's got a loud voice who can help me out and read number nine? Anyone? Please, Daniel. 